Hi, I'm here today with Lee Martinson. Lee, Lee is the uh, Customer Success Manager at uh, Snap Projections. And Lee's going to help, uh, help us walk through how to model the guaranteed income supplement, which turns out to be way harder than it should be. Is that about right, Lee? I think that's about right after putting this together. You're right. <laughs> okay. And I think a lot of people will say, well, it's going to be a lot like old age security, but it really isn't. Old age security, it's like you flip a switch and then there's a 15% calculation. That's not at all the case here, which is why this was such a sort of intensive exercise to build this thing, Lee. Is that fair? Yeah, once you know the information, it's pretty easy to add it into the projections. It's just figuring out that benefit to start with. Yeah, perfect. So you've got some uh, case studies here. Can you take us through the um, case studies, Lee? Sure. Yeah, so first, I'm just going to point out that uh, I've written an article all about modeling uh, the GIS in SNAP projections, a little bit of intro here. And then this article details the examples that we're going to go through uh, as well. So all about determining the GIS benefits. We're able to look up at the Government of Canada website for how much a person would be eligible to receive. And it's gonna be based on the income. Now you have to classify that income to, to know if you should include it or not. So for example, we're not gonna include OAS income in a person's yearly income. And we're gonna go through that in the example. So it's probably easiest if we just start with the first example. Yeah. And just while okay. you scroll over there, Lee, I'll just mention, so a lot of people who are familiar with the old age security clawback, I find this is a common challenge. OAS, you start clawback at about $80,000 in 2021. GIS, you start at the first dollar of income. I find a lot of people have a hard time wrapping their heads around that. Now, mm -hmm. there's some exceptions that I know you're going to talk about here. So. Right, right. We're just going to talk about a couple of exceptions. Uh, the first example is going to be the simplest one. So we'll get started with an easy one. Um, basically, we're going to look at a single person with you know, no employment income, no self-employment income. Uh, they're receiving uh, income from OAS, from CPP, and from RIF income. So I'll jump on over uh, into the what we call the planning page here, where we've got this projection uploaded. So it's the year 2021, and here's CPP income, OAS, and then RIF. We can take a look at uh, the taxable income details here, which is just going to um, add together for us those government benefits that, that Salvatore is already receiving. The easiest thing here to look at is that we just can add up in the first year 9,000 plus 7,000 CPP. That's the income that we're going to include when we're going to look up the benefit for GIS that this person would be eligible for. We can exclude OAS income. So what we can do is look up under this table, which is linked to in the article. Um, we were looking for a single person who is receiving o OAS, which you need to be in order to receive GIS as well. So in this range of, there's so many ranges, which is why it's really difficult you might be asking, you know, well, why is this not calculated for me automatically in SNAP projections? You know, that would be awesome. Like, it would be great if we could do that. Right now, we found that, um, you know, you see, this is just one selected income range. There's, you know, thousands of rows of, of data that gets updated quarterly. And to store all this information um, would just be a, a lot for the amount of time that people need to include GIS in the projections. So that's why we're showing you how to do it um, as opposed to calculating it for you. And it's not one consistent rate of clawback. It's not like OAS, which is 15%. It's anywhere from, I think it's 41 cents on the dollar up to 63 cents on the dollar, depending where you land in that income level. And, and depending, yeah, it depends on if you're married as well and how much OAS you're receiving. It's, it's, it's too many things to consider kind of automatically. Yeah. yeah. So with, with this person's $16,000 of yearly income for GIS purposes, the calculation, I mean, they have more because they have OAS as well, but we don't include that. So we've got $135 a month, $135.86. So what we're gonna do is multiply that out by 12 and come back to the planning page. And what we wanna do is include that income. So that amount is gonna be uh, about $1,600. So how do I do that in SNAP? Well, all I can, it's pretty easy. All we do is we go to the income page here and we're gonna add a new income. So I just click add income and I can call it GIS. This is gonna be the title of the column. And I'm um, 
I can either put a zero here, it's gonna fill in zeros in that column, we'll do that for now. The type is gonna be other, so it's not employment income or any kind of dividend income. It's not taxable, and I don't have to worry about it affecting RSP room, so I can just click back to planning page, and we'll have a new column for GIS that has zeros in it, so like to start with, but I just click on that amount, zero, and I'm gonna change it to 1630.32. That was the amount that multiplying the um, $135 a month would work out to. I can say, I wanna copy that down. And then we're assuming that over time, like GIS will get indexed, just like uh, CPP is gonna be indexed over time. And we have the RIF withdrawals in indexed as well. So we'll just index GIS, copy this down. And then I can just click run scenario to get it to update. So now we've got the additional $1,600 a year of GIS income. And that all assumes no change, that assumes inflation. It, it really, as long as you've got somebody who's in a static position, that works reasonably well. That's right. So we can see over here, we've got it set up right now that whatever money is left over is just going to be spent. And it's showing that amount right here in this column for us in real dollars. So he has about $24,000 remaining after he receives that income and pays his taxes. And that stays pretty consistent, you know, over the lifetime until he's 90 years old. You can see that it does go up with inflation. So in nominal dollars, you know, when he's 90 years old, he actually has 41,718 that he's spending in that future year, but that would be like spending 25,000 today. Yeah, that's okay. pretty straightforward. That's a good useful starting point, I think, Lee. Okay, all yeah. right, so we'll get a little more complicated now. <laughs> Why not? All right, uh, so the second example, let's just take a look back at the, at the article here that's gonna talk a bit about it. And what we're gonna add in here is employment income and self-employment income. So here we have, this is gonna change the clawback. So Jason, you pointed out last time yeah. we talked, this is, this is I a didn't little even bit realize complicated. this. <laughs> no, so this used to be, it used to be that for employment income only, I think some people watching will know this, that up until 2019, your first $3,500 of employment income was exempted from the GIS calculation. Okay. Um, and that wasn't terribly helpful. It was a good starting point, but there was a recognition that there was still a lot of people who were losing GIS dollars and still sort of below that senior's poverty line. The whole idea here, of course, is GIS is supposed to keep you above the poverty line as a senior. So right. the change that we saw in 2019 here was that you get a $5,000 exemption for either employment or self-employment income. So okay. the amount changed from 3,500 to 5,000 and we added self-employment income in here. So, and they would get bundled together. So if you had $3,000 of employment and 2,000 of self-employment, you hit that $5,000 cap. So that first 5,000, no impact at all on your GIS. And then, because we love our complexity, between $5,000 and $15,000, <laughs> you only have half the rate of clawback on your GIS. So a simple example, if you had somebody with $15,000 of employment income or self-employment income, their first 5,000, no problem. The next 10,000 would create a clawback equivalent to let's say $5,000 of RIF withdrawal. Does that make sense? Am I speaking enough? Like that's, that's as plain as I can make it, Lee, I don't know. It's Yeah, because that additional, headache. 10,000 to take them up to 15,000, basically you can cut it in half because it's a 50% exemption. Yeah, that's that makes perfect. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's a very, very easy explanation to get wrong, which is why I want to verify with you that I did it okay, so. Right, and I wrote it down in two ways here as well because it, it, it is a little bit confusing. So Annette is our second example and, and she has some CPP income, so $4,000, which will not have any exemptions, but then she also has employment income and self-employment income. And we've we've split them out, but really, like you said, they would they're they were treated the same, right? So uh the clawback is gonna be based on uh whatever, four thousand from CPP, which is not exempt, but then one thousand from employment. So how do we get that number? There's the five thousand dollar exemption. So that leaves two thousand for the employment income, and then that's fifty percent exempt. So that gives us 1000. <laughs> and then the rest, the 5000 from self-employment, again, I just think of it as like half 
like you said, half the normal clawback applies. So there's 2,500. So her total income to figure out what her GIS benefit would be after you taking off all those exemptions would be $7,500. So that's what we're going to look up in the table, not the original $16,000. Perfect. Okay. Couldn't, couldn't be easier, could it? <laughs> so, oh, I got to log back in. All right. Back to Annette here. I've made this a really short example. Just I, I only uh, did the projections for you know five, six years here. And we've got her employment income, self-employment income, and CPP and OAS. So the next step here is just going to be to put in what the GIS benefit is. So it's the same thing. I would go to the you know income page. I'm adding a new um, a new column here for GIS, the amount zero again, other type, not taxable. And then I could, you know, enter the amount right there, but I find it easiest just to know where I am, what year it is, and and, and enter it here. So for her, 7,500, we're going to have to go back to the payment amounts big table. And on this page, if you kind of scroll down to the bottom, this is where you can look up. So you can do a PDF version, um, or you can just go to their tables that are online. And then I scroll through here and look for $7,500. So you can see how much data is here. <laughs> uh, again, I got to sc scroll through here to find the 7,500. So I know that's you know, not even that range that's in here. This 522.82, multiply that out by 12, come back here, and then I put it in, which is 6,274. So again, I'm going to index that and copy it down to the end of the projections <clears throat> because she's very consistent as well. We got her em both employment and self-employment income uh, going up. Now, eventually she may stop working. So then you would, you know, even have a higher um, benefit at that point. So you want to pay attention in the projections to see what's happening in the future year. Yeah. When do you take RIF income? When does a pension start? What about Canada Pension Plan? And these are all things we go over in the Retiring on a Low Income course, which was sort of the original impetus for, for you and I chatting about this. Right. Yeah. And of course, yeah, so, TFSA has no impact, right? That's so. Right. Yeah, perfect. So I can just show you quickly um, that I have another window open here, another plan. So this is just an example of, of someone who has some, some RIF income that will be starting. They also have some investment. So um, if you have investment income, you're going to be also taxed on that. And that would be part of your the threshold value that you're going to need to know. So that's where we can start using this, this taxable income column to, to, to pay attention. Um, in this case, we figured that he would be eligible for GIS kind of right at the beginning of the projections. But then when his RIF income started, it's going to bump up his taxable income. So it's not by a lot, but you know, he was at 2,300. Now he's at 20 or 23,000. Now he's at 26,000. So we'd want to maybe recalculate at that point, what the GIS benefit would be and keep watching because at some point it exceeds the threshold that he would not even be able to get any more GIS at all. And in this case, it was because he, he only had his registered account left and he had to take everything from there. So I'm not saying this is the best plan for him. I'm just showing you an example <laughs> that um, this is, you know, what you can keep an eye on. Yeah, perfect. That's greatly. Any other comments about sort of using SNAP in a scenario like this? Anything that we should have touched on that we didn't? Um, no, I don't think so. I think the main, the one thing you might want to know is that you can go to government benefits up here uh, to adjust any CPP and, and OAS. Uh, amounts, uh, percentages that they, you would expect the person to be receiving. And that's where you would edit those values. So that's definitely something you would want to know. Um, anything else? I think from here, how you get to our help section, that's something that's, that's helpful. You can just click up on the top right and click help. And how you get to that article that I mentioned would just be, you can just type in GIS, for example, you're going to get some answers here go to this article and this details uh, additionally this example C, the one that where the income changes over the course of the projections. So this is all here for you to, to read over. And if you do have any questions, uh, yeah, if you're using SNAP projections, you can always reach us for help up here at the top. There's our support number and our uh, contact email. You also have the link on there to the Government of Canada form, which can be I helpful do. for figuring out those income exemptions. 
Yeah. So for example, if you're not sure if capital gains or taxable capital gains are the included amount, the form tells you that taxable capital gains are the included amount. So it's a good, That's good right. reference. Yeah. Yeah. So this takes you right to the detailed form and there is the information about those exemptions is there. It's just um, at, the, at the end. <laughs> so yes. you just have to download it from here. Yeah. And it, yeah, it does take a little navigation, but it's, it's a, it's, it's the answer ultimately to most questions. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's great, Lee. Thanks okay. so much for your time today. And thanks for putting in the work on this. I know you put in a lot of work on this and I know GIS is not something that's like a huge revenue generating uh, <laughs> result, but uh, I know that a lot of our, um, the students have gone through the retiring on a low income course will really be grateful for that. So thanks. Yeah, we've definitely had questions on it. Uh, it does come up. So this is helpful for us to have it available. And yeah, thanks for reaching out to, to work on this with me. Yeah, perfect. Really enjoyed it. Thanks. Okay, you're welcome.